welcome to Mercedes-Benz Stadium here in ATL Atlanta, Georgia, USA, as tomorrow night, Triller Fight Club presents an evening of sports and entertainment like no other. It's going to be a great night, but our main event is well worth it. It's On the evening of April 17th, 2021, a boxing match took place. This in itself was nothing out of the ordinary. Thousands of boxing matches take place every year and this was but one of them. Neither competitor was well known in the boxing world. They had a worse combined record than the Flaming Lips album Zarika, with both men's records adding up to a whopping 2 wins, 0 losses. Looking at their records alone, you'd have been forgiven for assuming this was the prelim fight for the undercard of a main event that even the families of the competitors would have illegally streamed. Looking at it from a purely statistical point of view, in any other era, this fight would have been more forgettable than Vanilla Ice's other song. Yet this fight between a man with two wins and zero losses versus a man with an 0-0 record who had never even boxed at an amateur or professional level was the main event of a pay-per-view card that cost $50 and sold half a million buys. The disclosed purses of both fighters exceeded the purses of most UFC main event fighters even before factoring in any pay-per-view points that they were entitled to. That fight was Jake Paul versus Ben Askren, and it was the nexus point for a gold rush of influencers, bloggers, vloggers, and other people who would be considered a burden on society if not for the advent of the internet to clamour for big money fights against Jake Paul or other high profile YouTubers. I'm gonna suck your fucking dick. <laughs> Even UFC champions like Francis Ngannou started wondering why he was fighting monsters like Cyril Gann for nothing but a pair of The Rock's shoes and a six-pack of Modelo, brewed for those with a fighting spirit, when Ben Askren is getting paid half a million plus pay-per-view points to fight a former Disney kid and current crypto scammer. All the crypto scams Jake Paul has done because the list is long. I've already counted five of them. Do I even have to say allegedly at this point? In 2017, the obscene amount of revenue generated by Mayweather vs McGregor kickstarted a series of high-profile boxing matches between boxers and people who aren't boxers. This ultimately gave rise to the phenomenon we now know as YouTube boxing. Ah! But anticipated they go oh, away. Let's go! And about you this ain't moment, ready for me! You ain't moment, ready for me! Fight! We are living in a reality where Jake Paul earns more money per fight than the budget for James Cameron's horny sci-fi smurf movie. And some of the goofiest fucking fights you'll ever see are making more money than Pablo Escobar's 401k. But the YouTube boxing craze is not a new phenomenon. Combat sports have always had one foot firmly planted in the world of spectacle fights. Boxers were boxing wrestlers with O and O records as far back as the 1940s. Valle Tudo literally started as a carnival attraction, and Pride FC pitted people like Giant Silva and Emmanuel Yarborough against the smallest people they could find. Combat sports are riddled with tales of crossover, spectacle, and freak show fights. Here comes the science bit. For this video, I've placed these fights into three distinct eras, starting in the mid 1900s with the crossover fights that actually held any kind of importance to the development of MMA. The second category is the freak show fights like Yarborough vs. Takase that seem to exist for no real reason other than to try and get someone killed in the most hilarious manner possible. And the final category is the godless pandemonium we inhabit today, where YouTubers are getting paid more than the people trying to cure childhood leukemia to put on the most embarrassing fights since Andrew Tate fought a teenage girl and got his ass handed to him. Imagine it's the 20s. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell, 
blower above his only sky. Imagine all the people. Uh, hit my. This is my eighth. Yours is so cool. I love the red heart sunglasses. I love the captain. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table, especially Hitler. It isn't hard to do. Nothing will care or die for. Oh god, no, no, not not the shit 20s, the good 20s, the roaring 20s. The decade when you probably did the Charleston with F. Scott Fitzgerald on the hood of your brand new Model T Ford. And if you're a fan of combat sports in this decade, you know the name of Jack Dempsey. Oh man, I, I'm crazy about Jack Dempsey. It's because of his ferocious intensity, you know, there's no one like him. Jack Dempsey was one of the toughest human beings to ever walk this earth. He dropped out of school aged 8 to start working and as a teenager travelled the countryside sleeping in hobo camps and made money by challenging people to fights and bars. Of his early days, Jack said, When I was a young fellow, I was knocked down plenty. I wanted to stay down, but I couldn't. I had to collect the two dollars for winning or go hungry. I had to get up. I was one of those hungry fighters. You could have hit me on the chin with a sledgehammer for five dollars. When you haven't eaten for two days, you'll understand. Even during his glory days atop the heavyweight division, life still found a way to beat him down. Dempsey's brother killed his wife in a murder-suicide. In the middle of camp for his upcoming fight, Dempsey himself had to identify the bodies. Dempsey's boxing career began in 1914, and by 1919, he found himself a heavyweight title challenger against 6'6", six 246-pound six, giant Jess Willard. By comparison to its modern-day iteration, boxing in the early 1900s had a much more laissez-faire attitude towards human life, and brain health was about as alien a concept to fighters of this era as that of Wi-Fi. In 1915, Willard had won the title from Jack Johnson in round 26 of a fight scheduled for 45. By comparison, Tyson Fury's last three fights amounted to 27 rounds over the course of 14 months. Willard did that in one afternoon in 103 degree heat. Despite a size difference normally reserved for my daydreams about Lady Hellbender, I can be quite forceful. Hard as a rock, man. Let me show you something. Dempsey swarmed Willard with a ceaseless discharge of shots in an effort to end the fight as quickly as possible. In modern day boxing, if you knock your opponent down three times in a single round, it automatically ends a fight. Dempsey proceeded to score seven knockdowns in round one alone. To further compound the general sense of whimsy surrounding the value of human life in the 1920s, a fighter wasn't required to move to a neutral corner after scoring a knockdown, so Dempsey loomed over Willard as he struggled to stand up and started windmilling as soon as he was even remotely considered bipedal. After a three-round mauling, often considered one of the worst beatings in professional boxing, Dempsey was the 1919 heavyweight champion. Jack Dempsey was to the 20s what Conor McGregor was to the mid 2010s. He was a superstar who made millions and transcended the sport. The only difference being, Dempsey actually defended his titles and never exposed himself as a witless arsehole on social media. Do you wanna go to war, man, yeah? Do you wanna go to fucking war? Dempsey's title defense against George Carpentier was the first boxing match to ever break a million dollar gate with over 91,000 attendees and his fights were instrumental in the evolution of live broadcasting. Dempsey was one of the first ever bona fide combat sports superstars. He would eventually lose the heavyweight title to Gene Tunney in 1926, they rematched in 1927, and despite a controversy over Tunney being given an extremely long count after a knockdown, Tunney won a unanimous decision and Dempsey retired from boxing for good. But this being boxing, his retirement was about as long lived as Power Slap's TV deal. If you ask anyone what the first ever mixed martial arts contest was, you'll get a dozen different answers, ranging from Hoist Gracie vs Ken Shamrock at UFC 1, to Ali vs Inoki, to Helio Gracie vs Masahiko Kimura. 
But years before any of those fights took place, Dempsey's manager cooked up an idea to save Jack from bankruptcy and in the process accidentally birthed what was arguably the world's first mixed martial arts fight. By 1940, Dempsey had been retired for 13 years. As is often the case with people who come from dirt-eating poverty, he was quick to give away or be conned out of his money. The man who once headlined the first ever million dollar boxing event and sold out 120,000 seats in a stadium whose name I can't even pronounce was broke. Dempsey was reduced to making appearances at circuses for a handful of limp-brained gawkers or taking jobs as a guest referee in wrestling matches to make ends meet. During one guest referee spot, a wrestler named Clarence Cowboy Luttrell decided to make a name for himself off of the aging champion. He shoved Dempsey across the ring and post-match tried to sucker punch him backstage. Whether this was all hype brewed up by Dempsey's manager to sell a fight between them, or whether it was real heat is still debatable, but on July 1st, 1940, the former heavyweight champion of the world would face an almost completely unknown pro wrestler in a real fight for a purse of $4,000. It's July 1st, 1940. The famed Manasseh Mauler, Jack Dempsey, former world heavyweight champion, returns to the ring after an eight-year absence and takes on Cowboy Luttrell in Atlanta, Georgia. You'd be forgiven for thinking that people arguing over judo, jiu-jitsu, boxing, or Muay Thai as the best martial art is a relatively modern invention. But proving that pointless bickering will always be fashionable, Luttrell tried to hype the fight by saying, There's never been a boxer who could beat a good wrestler. I want to be known as the guy who KO'd Dempsey. The fight wasn't billed as an exhibition, but neither was it a pro boxing match. Till this day, it still doesn't show on Dempsey's boxing record. Hell, it doesn't even show on his Wikipedia. The press at the time were skeptical as to whether this was a real fight or not, so Jack reassured them by saying, It's no gag. We're going to fight with gloves. I ought to knock him out quick because I can still punch, and he doesn't know how to fight. All the talking worked. On the night of July 1st, 12,000 people filled out the Ponce de Leon baseball stadium to find out what happens when a wrestler fights a boxer. But underneath the media interest and Dempsey's own self-belief that a win against Cowboy could bring him out of retirement for a title shot against Joe Lewis was a depressing visual that summed up the reality of this farcical matchup. Dempsey's corner stool was nothing more than an upturned beer crate. It's claimed by some that the entire fight was a work, that the outcome was predetermined. But if the outcome was predetermined, then Cowboy Luttrell deserves to be placed in the stupidest motherfuckers of all time Hall of Fame, as he would have had to agree to let Dempsey cave his face in for $800. Luttrell was a trailblazer for grapplers like Ronda Rousey, who completely forgot how to grapple in the middle of a fight. Over the course of two rounds, Dempsey did his best to shave a few digits off of Luttrell's life expectancy. Cowboy was about as offensive as a Wiggles reunion tour. He landed almost no shots and attempted zero grappling. Meanwhile, Dempsey was landing more headshots than Anya Taylor-Joy's modelling portfolio. If this was a worked fight, then it was worked harder than a Cambodian sweatshop. Ultimately, in round two, Luttrell is beaten so badly he crashes through the ropes where he reportedly landed on a TV camera and was knocked unconscious. I see some battle wounds and some bruises. That's great. Dempsey had won his first fight since 1927, such as it was. But Dempsey wasn't done mixing the martial arts. He still seemed to be holding on to the vague notion that a couple of freak show wins like this could catapult him back into title contention. So two weeks after the cowboy fight, Dempsey's manager, Max Waxman, organized another hastily thrown together boxing versus wrestling fight. This time, Dempsey would face a wrestler named Wild Bull Curry. We often joke that MMA is a carnival ass sport, but in Bull Curry's case, he was literally a carnival ass fighter. He toured America with various circuses, working as a strong man, taking on any member of the public that wanted to challenge him. As a wrestler, Curry was famous for his hardcore style wrestling. At one match, he beat his opponent with a cinder block, 
which led to him being arrested for real. As far as I can find, no media of this fight exists, aside from a few promotional posters, but from the detailed description of the bout in a Sports Illustrated article from 1995, this was the first boxer versus wrestler bout where the wrestler actually did some wrestling. As such, I felt it was important to document this lost fight, so please allow me to present Jack Dempsey vs. Bull Curry, the manga adaptation. July 1940, Detroit Fairgrounds Coliseum. Dempsey and Curry square off in front of a packed house. The bell rings, and Curry immediately fares better than Cowboy Luttrell by actually employing some grappling techniques. The wild bull grabs Dempsey in a headlock. Dempsey's face is practically purple, but the referee steps in to break it up for reasons unknown. Bull Curry is furious. He swings wildly, even landing a shot or two, but he's hopelessly outclassed on the feet. He falls back on his wrestling by shooting a blast double that catapults both fighters out of the ring, where they crash through the desk of Michigan State Boxing Commissioner John Hetch. Both fighters are returned to the ring, where Dempsey drops Curry with a body shot that looks like it used up his entire EX gauge. Curry doesn't make the count, and Dempsey is proclaimed the winner. But Curry isn't done, and in true pro wrestling style, Sneak attacks Dempsey from behind. <laughs> Chaos erupts, the police invade the ring, and Dempsey is escorted to safety. Shockingly, despite the absolutely farcical scenes of Bull Curry spear tackling Dempsey through the ropes, this fight wasn't even the last boxer versus wrestler fight Dempsey was involved in. He had one more match against a wrestler named the Purple Flash, aka Ellis Bashara. It was another farce, and Dempsey flattened Bashara in the second round. Much like Cowboy Luttrell, Bashara employed zero grappling techniques. Four days after that fight, Dempsey quietly announced his retirement, salvaging what was left of his reputation as a former heavyweight champion. It's 1963. 23 years have passed since Dempsey risked his reputation fighting mono-browed wrestlers for hot dog chugging inbreds. It's a time of political and social upheaval. Hippies are spreading venereal disease like microwaved peanut butter, and every legendary band you love is in the process of doing something that will make listening to their music deeply uncomfortable come 2020. And a long-forgotten Playboy clone called Rogue Magazine runs an inflammatory article titled The Judo Bums. The article was nothing more than a Cold War era iteration of a Reddit shitpost. The author, a boxer named Jim Beck, used the article to extend the middle finger of friendship to all practitioners of Eastern martial arts. Beck issued a call out so dramatic, so super villain esque, that I can't do it justice, and there's only one person I know who truly can. Judo bombs, hear me one and all. It is one thing to fracture pine boards, bricks, and assorted inanimate objects, but quite another to climb into a ring with a trained and less cooperative target. My money is ready. Where are the takers? Worth every penny. But Beck's callout offered more than just a literary cockslap to the proto weeaboos of America. He also offered $1,000 to any judo, karate, or other assorted bum that could beat a boxer in the ring. The challenge found its way to the gym of one Ed Parker. Parker was both a judo and a karate bum, being the owner of the first karate dojo in the western United States, known as the grandfather of American Kempo, and star of the greatest fight scene in cinematic history. <laughs> Among his students, was a man called Jean LaBelle. LaBelle is revered as a pioneer of mixed martial arts. As early as the 60s, he saw the importance of cross-training in various striking and grappling arts. He was a Hollywood stuntman with the permanent expression of a Madame Tussauds waxwork that was left under a heat lamp. He had a background in judo and pro wrestling, in the days when pro wrestlers were legit tough guys who trained catch wrestling and used real submission holds in scripted matches. 
LaBelle is a hugely important figure in martial arts and in the development of MMA, a charismatic trash-talking pioneer of the sport who deserves all the plaudits that could be given to him. Having said all that... LaBelle is a fantastic example of the paradox of the man who says, I always lie. With him, it's impossible to separate fact from fiction. He was notorious for embellishing every one of his stories to the point of unrecognisability. Aside from that one time he choked out Steven Seagal and made him shit in his pants, almost all of his stories should be considered as those of an unreliable narrator. LaBelle would tell everyone about how he taught grappling to Bruce Lee and beat a top 5 light heavyweight boxer in the world's first MMA fight. But the lesser known stories about him are even more interesting, such as the time in 1976 when he was charged with being an accessory to murder in a completely true and absolutely insane story involving a pornographer, a private detective, a pharmacy that sold tailor-made drugs to superstars, gun running and shady donations to Richard Nixon's 1972 presidential campaign. But before any of that happened, back in 1963, Jean LaBelle was the fighter chosen to answer Jim Beck's judo bums call out. According to Jean, he was chosen to answer Beck's call out, not because he was well known as a karate or kempo guy, but because Ed Parker considered him to be, and I quote, the most sadistic bastard I know. While it's tempting to make a video that heaps gushing praise upon this fight and perpetuates the narrative that judo destroyed boxing and we all rode off into the sunset on a Modelo float destined for UFC 1, the reality, like LaBelle himself, is far more complicated. LaBelle's tales around the Milo Savage fight have grown in the telling over the years. It is 100% true that this fight should be considered the first ever televised mixed martial arts fight. And it is also true that modern MMA owes a massive debt to both LaBelle and Savage. But if you listen to anyone talk about this fight nowadays, you're basically hearing LaBelle's account of the fight coming out of their mouth. Savage died in 1998, before MMA exploded in the mainstream, so his account of the fight has pretty much been lost to history. According to Gene, Jim Beck was a bigger journeyman than Willie Fogg. But at the 11th hour, Beck was bait and switched with Milo Savage. LaBelle claimed Savage was a top 5 light heavyweight who also had a wrestling background and a much tougher fight than Jim Beck. But the truth was, Savage was the journeyman, with a record of 49 wins, 45 losses and 10 draws. He certainly was no bum, but if he had ever had a prime, by 1963 he was long past it. After the fight with LaBelle, he only had one more fight, and that was six years later, in 1970. Footage of the fight that exists today mostly consists of the finish. LaBelle successfully throws Savage and finishes him with a gi choke. Despite extensive digging, this is the only footage of the match that I can find. But Black Belt Magazine were in attendance that night and wrote a detailed round-by-round -round breakdown. To read this version of the fight, Savage put up a much better performance than expected. He shook off most of LaBelle's early throw attempts and even attempted a foot sweep of his own. LaBelle won the match, but it wasn't the dominant performance it's made out to be today. Despite the advantage of the boxer being forced to wear a gi, the fight lasted four rounds and Savage showed a knowledge of grappling that surprised many. This is where many of the tall tales around this fight started to spring up. LaBelle had an injured shoulder, Savage had coated his entire gi in Vaseline, Savage had an advantage by wearing a karate gi instead of a judo gi, Savage was wearing brass knuckles under his gloves. LaBelle even claimed there was a riot post-fight and that a member of the crowd stabbed him on the way out of the arena. But according to Black Belt Magazine's coverage, while the crowd did throw a few things into the ring, they were ultimately placated after former boxing champion Gene Fulmer climbed into the ring to congratulate LaBelle. There's certainly no mention of LaBelle getting stabbed, which is something you'd imagine they'd have reported pretty heavily given how horny for Blade Combat Black Belt Magazine was. The importance of this fight in the overall development of MMA cannot be overstated, but having said that, LaBelle, with his background in pro wrestling gimmickry, certainly tried his best. 
Nowadays, people genuinely believe that he fought with only one arm against a greased up Balrog from Street Fighter whose gi was made out of paper and was wearing boxing gloves that had tasers in them like in that Shock Fights video. Like all of LaBelle's stories, maybe that's exactly how it went down, but then again, maybe it wasn't. 1963 was a vintage year for freak show fights. Aside from LaBelle vs Savage, a little known mixed rules match took place in Phoenix, Arizona. Archie Moore, the longest reigning light heavyweight champion of all time, fought a wrestler named Iron Mike DiBiase. And if that name sounds familiar to you, that's because Iron Mike is indeed the father of one of the best wrestling heels of the 1980s, the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. By 1963, Moore was 50 years old and broke. Much like Dempsey, he had been refereeing wrestling matches to make ends meet and was involved in an in-ring scuffle with DiBiase. A boxer versus wrestler fight was booked and again, much like Dempsey, Moore demolished the wrestler in three rounds. While we today can see the importance of these boxer versus grappler fights on the development of MMA, at the time, these fights were about as welcomed as Kanye West at a bar mitzvah. One reporter described Moore as shedding all semblance of dignity by doing a carnival routine for a Phoenix wrestling promoter, which should tell you exactly how people felt about these matchups back then. As the flower power generation grew up, cut their hair, and got jobs working for the man, the hopelessness and nihilism felt by their children birthed the punk revolution of the 1970s. And in 1976, the last and largest freak show fight of this era was being negotiated between the greatest boxer of all time and Japan's very own homegrown superhero. To fight a wrestler. I used to watch Gorgeous George, Argentina Roca, Freddie Blassie, Luthers, and the way they would grab each other, I just knew I could hit that man before he touched my shoulder. The beef between John Jones and DC is one of the most legendary beefs since the time Bo Kulina. It's a beef that could fill its own hour-long video, and at this stage is practically MMA's very own Moby Dick. And it all started when the two were introduced, and Jones joked to DC, I bet I could take you down. Ali vs Inoki, the biggest freak show fight since Andrew Tate fought a teenage girl and got 10-7. <laughs> was conceived under similar circumstances to the Jones DC beef. When Muhammad Ali met Ichiro Hata, an Olympian and president of the Japanese Amateur Wrestling Association, Ali joked to Hata, isn't there an oriental fighter who will challenge me? I'll give him one million dollars if he wins. But Hada didn't take this as some idle boasting. He spread the word of Ali's challenge until it became headline news, and as it turned out, there was an Asian fighter ready and willing to take him up on the offer. The 6 foot 3, 224 pound Japanese giant Antonio Inoki. Who's Asian as shit! <laughs> to the people of Japan, Inoki is like Stone Cold Steve Austin, the Pope and Batman combined. Picture a Japanese Conor McGregor but without all the everything that makes him such a passionately obnoxious troglodyte. Do you wanna go to fuck a mall? Inoki was the protege of a pro wrestler named Ricky Dozen, who himself was the Hulk Hogan of his day. After the catastrophic defeat suffered by the Japanese Empire in World War II, he helped bolster national pride thanks to wrestling matches where he routinely beat Americans or other assorted Western devils. Ricky Dozen was so influential, he would ultimately garner the nickname the father of pro wrestling. But in 1963, he was killed after being stabbed with a knife soaked in urine. In the most pointless death since Rose hogged all the room on the wardrobe, a Yakuza goon stepped on Ricky Dozen's shoe in a nightclub. He demanded an apology, but instead got a piss blade in the gut. Inoki picked up the torch dropped by Ricky Dozen and ran with it. His popularity was such that he had his own line of vitamin water, had a successful career in politics, appeared in the Baki the Grappler and Tiger Mask mangas, and even has his own line of condoms that feature the tagline, Use Without Question, which on a condom sounds like a command that could end up landing you in jail. So by 1976, 
Enoki's megastardom meant that he was the perfect opponent for Muhammad Ali. We've a new field now. We're going to Japan to take on this Antonio Inoki, the world's heavyweight karate wrestling champion. And this is a whole new thing. People have always wondered, how would a boxer do with a wrestler? I've always wanted to fight a wrestler. I see them grabbing each other and throwing each other down and twisting each other's arm. And I always say, boy, I could whoop him. All you got to do is hit him, hit him real fast and hard and move off of him. And now I'm going to get a chance to do it. Outside of Japan, Inoki was more unheard of than a Sam Alvey title shot, but Muhammad Ali required less introduction than the Kool-Aid man. What may need an introduction, however, was Ali's love of pro wrestling. In 1961, while still known as Cassius Clay, and about as famous for running his mouth as Helen Keller was, Ali took part in a radio interview with legendary pro wrestler Gorgeous George. Ali was captivated as Gorgeous George proceeded to talk more shit than a second-hand toilet salesman, and even more impressed when he saw how George's trash talk sold out arenas. Gorgeous George, a famous American wrestler, he was talking about, I am the prettiest wrestler. <laughs> I am great. Look at my beautiful blonde hair. And I said, this is a good idea. <laughs> and right away I start talking. I am the greatest. The realization that the public were paying money hand over fist just to see the trash talker lose helped mold Ali into his final form. By 1976, he had conquered the world of boxing, and thanks to his political activism and an abundance of charisma larger than the North Sea oil reserves, Ali was the biggest sports star on the planet. But Father Time is undefeated, and Ali's days in the sun were coming to an end. In the year pre Inoki, he had fought a who's who of journeymen Richard Dunn, Jimmy Young, Jean Pierre Koopman. Names more easily forgettable than a year old TikTok challenge. The only reason anyone remembers these fighters at all is because once upon a time they happened to share a ring with the greatest of all time. With the end of his career rapidly approaching and multiple ex wives to look after, Ali needed big money paydays and fighting bums like Dunn wasn't going to do it for long. Enter Antonio Inoki and the inception of the biggest mix rules fight to date. If NBA stars crossing over to freak show boxing fights sounds like a trend you primarily associate with the clown world of 2020's influencer boxing, think again. After he first lost to Joe Frazier in 1971, Ali set his sights on a spectacle fight with 7 foot 1 inch tall NBA star Wilt Chamberlain. The match never came to fruition, but the idea of crossover fights and the money they could generate stuck with Ali. While the pairing of Ali and Anoki might initially seem more random than the good lord's methodology for selecting which kid is going to get childhood leukemia, it actually made a lot of sense. Ali had been clamoring for crossover fights such as the one with Chamberlain, and he had a genuine love of pro wrestling. Anoki had taken part in multiple crossover fights already, such as the time he fought Olympic gold medalist Wilhelm Ruska. Inoki TKO'd Ruska with three belly-to-back suplexes in a row, and while the legitimacy of that fight may be more questionable than Ed Parker's special effects department, Inoki was still out here doing his best to mix the martial arts. The fight was scheduled for the 26th of June, 1976. Ali would face Inoki at the Budokan Hall in Tokyo for a purse of six million dollars, which in those days was the largest fight purse ever seen. Ali went on a promotional tour for the match, and while most people seemed to think he was joking about his next fight being against what he called the heavyweight wrestling and karate champion of the world, it was no joke. He added a Taekwondo master named Jun Ri to his entourage to help him prepare for the match. When you take Jun Ri self-defense, then you too can say, nobody bothers me, nobody bothers me, call USA 1000. Nobody buys me. Nobody buys me either. 
which was unusual as learning Taekwondo to fight a wrestler makes about as much sense as learning French to prepare for a chemistry exam. But this being the first ever MMA fight, it's forgivable as they were kind of making it up as they went along. Ri visited Ali's training camp several days per month with the intent on teaching Ali his secret weapon, deadlier than the dim Mac itself, a punch he himself had learned from Bruce Lee. That secret weapon was called the Accu Punch. Jun Ri is his name. He's training me now for the Japanese wrestler. Yes, that wasn't the right hand. That was the unique Accu Punch. But when you hit a man, as soon as you hit him, you turn it. It's a quick. According to Ri, the Accu Punch is a punch with your body and mind as one. When you decide to punch, you've already punched. This creates a tremendous acceleration and increases the punching power. Okay. All of that sounds to me like the kind of fight advice you'd get from a talking onion or the best in class bullshit you'd hear from someone like George Dillman. But at least Ali would never fall for Dillman's crap. Uh, uh, Ali would, he would never know. Uh, oh God. At this point, I'd like to take a step back and just let you appreciate the insanity of what was happening here. The heavyweight boxing champion of the world was learning secret kung fu techniques taught by Bruce Lee to a taekwondo grandmaster for application during the world's first boxer versus wrestler slash karate fight. If all of this sounds insane to us in 2023, Try and imagine how all of this kung fu, acupunch, karate, wrestling, clownery sounded to people in 1976. If I asked you to think of the two shadiest sports promoters working today, who immediately springs to mind? If you said Bob Arum and Vince McMahon, congratulations, you're correct. And in 76, both Vinnie Mac and Bob Arum were on hand to leech as much money off of Ali vs. Anoki as possible. World heavyweight boxing champion Muhammad, and we can have just a word with you if we may, please. Well, you may be the king in the ring, then again you may not. Of course, this was a training session, it appears as though it got a little bit out of hand there with Buddy Will. While the fight took place in Tokyo, Vince McMahon Sr. would handle the US side of operations, as the fight would be broadcast live to a sold-out Shea Stadium. McMahon Jr. was on site in Tokyo to handle promotion there, and Bob Arum was just there to feast on the souls of dead children trapped inside Jizo statues, allegedly. Arum was under the impression that the fight was a work. In a 2012 interview with Sports Illustrated, he explained how Vince McMahon Sr. had mapped out how the fight was supposed to play out. Arum said, The way Vince wrote it, Ali was supposed to come out and look like he was hitting Inoki with punches. Now wrestlers, they use razors to cut themselves, so Inoki was supposed to cut himself and blood would be everywhere. Then Ali would turn to the ref and say, hey, please stop the fight. Then Inoki would jump up on Ali's back and pin him. Ali would get up and say this was just like Pearl Harbor, then we'd all go home. The situation wasn't helped at all by Ali's preparation for the fight, which involved him fighting a wrestler named Buddy Wolf, in a match more poorly staged than the average nativity play. Between the talk of Bruce Lee's death punch and Ali horsing around with wrestlers in clearly worked fights, no one knew if Ali vs. Anoki would be a work, a shoot, or just an elaborate joke taken too far. They always want to know what would happen if Wolfman meets Frankenstein. Or if the world's greatest fighter meets the world's greatest martial art crossola. And you should see every theater's gonna be packed. They're gonna be lined up. Hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. They love to see blood in this civilization. Ultimately, the fight went ahead ostensibly as a real fight but with more last-minute rule changes than a poorly organized orgy. Inoki was completely hamstrung by the new rule set. He couldn't throw or tackle Ali, and he wasn't allowed kick unless one knee was in contact with the mat. The referee on hand to make sure all these rules were adhered to was none other than Jean LaBelle himself. On the other side of the world, 
at Shea Stadium in New York, a live broadcast of the fight took place in front of a sold-out arena. In what could be considered the world's first pay-per-view, Andre the Giant would fight a boxer named Chuck Wepner before switching to the televised broadcast of Ali vs. Inoki. And before we go on, a little known fact about Chuck Wepner and the history of freak show fights. In the 1970s, Wepner reached peak freak show fighter status after he had a boxing match with an adult black bear named Victor the Wrestling Bear. I don't get in the ring with just any bear. This was Victor the Bear. He was on the Ed Sullivan Show. He was a very world famous bear. The bell rang and I started throwing jabs. And I was hitting him in the face and in the nose. And the bear was starting to get crazy looking. The bear rushed me, grabbed me, picked me up and threw me 15 feet in the air. And I spun around looking to get up and the bear was on top of me. The trainer, he blew the whistle. And Ali Stock come over and say, hey, great fight, you put on a heck of a show. And I thought, are you out of your mind? This bear tried to kill me. Had Webner vs. Andre the Giant been the main event, fans may have left the world's first pay-per-view feeling somewhat satisfied. It was an entertaining match that culminated with Webner being picked up by Andre and hurled out of the ring, which ultimately turned this work into a shoot when a legitimate brawl broke out between both fighters' corners. But this was just the appetizer, and a rancid main event was still waiting to be served. Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion of the world in boxing. Antonio Inoki, the heavyweight champion of the world in wrestling. So this is round one. And that's it. If you stop this fight right now, you have just seen the single most entertaining part of this entire fight. Ali vs. Anoki is one hour long, one life force draining, soul depleting hour. It's longer than this video has been up until this point. It's also less entertaining than trying to find the joke in a Brendan Schaub stand up special. You need many, many stitches. This be worth paying your life, guaranteed. Oh, I get it. The joke is there are no jokes. Ah, that's so meta. Ali vs. Anoki is the kind of fight that would make you nostalgic for the scintillating action of Nama Yunus vs. Asparza 2. For 15 rounds, Anoki, hobbled by the rule changes, lies on his back and attempts to kick Ali's legs. And that's it. That's the entire fight. Very little else of note happens for 15 rounds, other than Ali jumping away from kicks and screaming for Anoki to stand up, while Anoki looks like a combat sports version of Quop. After 15 rounds of this, the fight was ruled a draw. Don F. Drager, a former US Marine, stunt double for Sean Connery, and author of The Comprehensive Guide to Asian Martial Arts, witnessed the events firsthand and wrote letters to a friend in the US describing what he saw. July 11th, 1976. The Ali fiasco was carefully staged. The main concern was not to injure Ali, causing Anoki to complain that by the rules and this concern, there was damn little that he could do to make it look good. By the way, the Budokan janitorial took almost a full day to clean up the garbage that was hurled at the two combatants as a result of their lousy performance. While the performance was indeed lousy, there was real damage done. Ali's left leg was beaten so badly, he suffered severe muscle damage, anemia caused by bleeding into the leg, and an accumulation of blood and fluid in the leg. Ali's personal doctor claimed his mobility never truly recovered after the beating his leg took on that June evening in 1976. In a shocking turn of events for a fight promoted by Bob Arum and Vince McMahon, Ali never received his promised $6 million either, reportedly earning closer to $1.6 million. While the fight itself was farcical and completely killed off any interest in mixed rules fights among the general public until the advent of the UFC in 1993, Looking back now, it's hard not to see how important this match was for the development of MMA. People tuned in because they genuinely expected to see a contest between boxing and wrestling. What they got 
was absolutely not that, but there was a genuine desire among the public to see what would happen when two wildly different styles clashed. History has been kind to Ali vs. Anoki. While the fight may have stunk worse than Wild Bull Curry's jockstrap, it is still looked upon fondly by fight fans nowadays, simply because it was a milestone in the history of the sport. Inoki wrestled his last match in 1998. Ali, by then inexorably gripped by Parkinson's disease, the result of a lack of information about brain health and a career that ran on far longer than it should have, travelled to Japan to watch his old adversary's final match. Ali, unable to perform public speaking duties, had an assistant read a message for Inoki. It was 1976 when I fought Antonio Inoki at the Budokan. In the ring, we were tough opponents. After that, we built love and friendship with mutual respect. So I feel a little less lonely now that Antonio has retired. It is my honour to be standing on the ring with my good friend after 22 years. Our future is bright and has a clear vision. Antonio Inoki and I put our best efforts into making world peace through sports, to prove there is only one mankind beyond the sexual, ethnical or cultural differences. It is my pleasure to come here today. Like a trash pile Mount Vesuvius, the world of freak show fights lay dormant in the years following the eruption of Ali vs. Anoki. Unsurprisingly, after delivering the biggest dud since the midwife at Jake Paul's birth, the public weren't clamouring for another crossover fight anytime soon. But by the mid 1980s, almost 10 years post Ali Anoki, martial arts underwent a resurrection Emperor Palpatine would be envious of thanks mostly to one movie. Concentrate, focus, power. Remember, balance. No mercy. Columbia Pictures presents The Karate Kid. The Karate Kid spawned dozens of imitators, launched the careers of millions of karate white belts, and caused a worldwide shortage of black pajamas. Its popularity was such that there was a renewed public interest in Asian martial arts, which snowballed until it became the ninja craze of the 1980s. For people who were supposed to be stealthy, you couldn't turn around without bumping into a ninja by the late 1980s. Video games, books, movies, cartoons, if you could stick a ninja on it, kids would buy it. If you weren't there to witness it firsthand, it can be a little difficult to explain how an entire generation of kids were caught up in crane kicking, kung fu gripping, ninja turtling nonsense. But to put it into 2020's context, it swept the globe like Mr. Beast playing Fortnite with Andrew Tate on TikTok. And having said that sentence, I'm off to go kill myself. By the 90s and the advent of the UFC, the ninja generation of the 1980s were grown-ups who hungered to see what would happen when a kung fu practitioner fought a boxer or a taekwondo master fought a fucking silverback gorilla or something. The early UFCs were all about these style versus style matchups, which made them fertile soil for freak show fights. And in the days when MMA was a fight and not a sport, the 5 foot 11, 200 pound Keith Hackney fought 6 foot 8, 600 pound Emmanuel Yarborough at UFC 3. Hackney primarily known for Kempo Karate and a really nice air conditioning business, was given one week's notice to prepare for a fight against a man who weighed three times what he did and had almost a foot in height advantage. The fight was a 1 minute 59 second long advert for why MMA should be banned globally. In the opening seconds, Hackney dropped Yarbrough with what he called a white crane strike, but what the average soccer hooligan would call windmilling. 
Yarborough recovered and bodied Hackney right through the octagon door. Once the fight was restarted, Hackney knocked Yarborough down again and proceeded to break his own hand, punching the back of Yarborough's basketball-sized head. In the days when a fight could only be ended by a KO or submission, all Big John McCarthy could do was ask Yarborough if he'd had enough of Hackney playing the drum parts of Devoured by Vermin on the back of his head. Yarborough verbally tapped out, David slew Goliath, and the freak show era was resurrected. While the UFC would dabble in these kind of fights over the years, by the end of the millennium, they were trying to clean their act up and look somewhat like a respectable sport in order to get John McCain off their back. But one organisation, unhindered by inconveniences such as governing bodies, rule sets or even good taste, elevated freak show fights to a high art. Pride FC were to freak show fights what the Beatles were to rock and roll. They may not have invented it, but they did their best to perfect it. Pride FC was the gold standard of grotesque. But while Dempsey's, Alley's and the early UFC's adventures in the world of sideshow fights were, on the surface, about finding out which martial art was the strongest, Pride seemed to just really want to see someone get fucking killed. The Japanese are obsessed with size. From Gundam to Godzilla, in the land of the rising sun, the bigger the better. And Pride had the biggest roster of monsters since Killer Instinct. Zulu Xenio was 6 foot 7, 390 pounds. Giant Silva was 7 foot 2, 380 pounds. And Pride was also home to the aforementioned Emmanuel Yarborough and the king of the freak show fights, Bob Sapp. Pride routinely pitted these meat titanics against the smallest people they could find. At Pride 3 in 1998, Yarborough was scheduled to fight Daiju Takase, who was 6 foot tall and 183 pounds. That's not exactly a small man, but when stacked up against the 6 foot 8, 600 pound Yarborough, Takase may as well have been Demetrius Johnson. One thing all these fighters had in common, aside from the sheer behemothness of them, was that they were all terrible fighters. Takase beat Yarborough just by circling him and peppering him with shots, while the big man struggled to keep up with him. Giant Silva lost six out of the seven fights he had in Pride. Zulu Xenio lost three of four Pride fights. And the majority of his wins outside of Pride are over people who don't even have a Wikipedia page. Bob Sapp was the only fighter who ever really showed promise. Despite losing his fight with Nogueira, he went down in history for the horror show scenes of lifting Nogueira like a bag of groceries and powerbombing him right onto his head. But after his devastating K1 loss to Mirko Krokop, in which Sapp's cheekbone was shattered with one punch, he kind of gave up actually trying to fight and became known primarily for two things tapping out almost as soon as a fight started, and collecting paychecks. But while we tend to think of people like Sap, Giant Silva or Yarborough when we talk about freak show fights, no one man exemplifies the spirit of freak show fighting more than Ikehisu Minowa, aka Minowa Man. Minowa Man is an anomaly in MMA. By all accounts, his career should probably have never progressed past its first couple of years. Fighting for the Pancrase promotion, in his first 13 fights, he won 2, lost 8, and drew 3. At one point, he was riding a 7-fight losing streak. Minowa was a bum. Like an Asian Sam Alvey or a Brooklyn brawler of Bushido, he was perennially regarded as a jobber in Pancrase. To his credit, some of his losses were to JMMA pioneers such as Yuki Kondo, but nevertheless, Minowa was still the guy you called up when you needed someone to take an L like a pro. But just when it seemed like Minowa was about to come down with a fatal case of C verticulitis, something strange happened to his career. He started winning. From October 1998 up till April 99, he went on a five-fight win streak before suffering a setback of two draws and a loss. 
Undeterred, he was entered into the ridiculously cool sounding Pancrase Neo Blood Tournament 99, which was the turning point of his career and sounded like the best Dreamcast beat em up you never played. He won three fights in a row and was proclaimed the Neo Blood 99 Tournament Champion. Following the tournament, he'd face off against highly respected Dutch kickboxer Semi Schilt, who at 6 foot 11 and 295 pounds had a massive size advantage over Minowa. Schilt won the fight, but Minowa took him to a decision, and the David v Goliath nature of the match was a portent of things to come. Minowa even fought in the pre Zufa era at UFC 25 in Japan. Adding to the growing mystique around him on his tale of the tape, his age was listed as unknown. He shed his old tentative fighting style and became a much more explosive fighter, routinely diving on any kind of leg lock or kimura he could grab a hold of. He ultimately became known for his submission game. His image too underwent transformation. Gone were the black trunks and boring hairstyle. Now he wore red spandex, sported a mullet, and draped the Japanese flag around him like the cape of a superhero. Minowa Man was born. In 2003 he went to Pride, where true to form, Pride fed him to the wolves by matching him up with a prime Vanderlei, Rampage, and Sakuraba. But undeterred by those losses, he kept on going. He improved his record to 35, 25 and 8. His pride run was notable not for the losses, but for the fact that he simply stopped caring about weight classes and routinely took part in open weight bouts. He fought and beat juiced up heavyweights like Kimo Leopoldo, Gilbert Ival and Stefan Lecco. He had freak show fights against Giant Silva and Butterbean. Against Silva, he dived for a rolling knee bar before finishing the 7 foot 2 behemoth with knees to the face. Most notably, he opened his match with Butterbean by landing a flying drop kick to the face, immediately followed by a second drop kick to the face. Despite being taken down and smothered by the 378 pound bean, Minowa escaped and submitted him with an arm bar. Hell, Minowa Man even fought a prime Mirko Krokop. He didn't win, but it all added to the legend of the man who would fight anyone, at any weight, at any time. After the collapse of Pride, Minowa Man found himself fighting for another Japanese promotion called Dream. Dream had a stable of decent fighters, but post Pride, they needed something to really make them stand out and draw in the casual eye. Knowing the Japanese love of steroid guzzling freak beasts, they concocted the Dream Super Dreadnought Tournament of 2009. And no, that's not a joke, it was actually called the Super Dreadnought GP, but for some dumbass reason they renamed it to the marginally less cool sounding Super Hulk GP. The Super Hulk GP was comprised of more comically massive humans than a Street Fighter 6 trailer. Hongman Choi, Jose Canseco, yes, the Jose Canseco, the baseball player most famous this side of the pond for being in that one episode of The Simpsons, and of course, the connoisseur's freak show fighter of choice, Bob Sapp. Even respected fighters like Mark Hunt and Gegard Mousasi were signed up, but the Super Dreadnought GP was an open weight tournament, so among all these bipedal skyscrapers of flesh and pharmacology, was Minowa Man. In the opening fight, he faced Bob Sapp. Despite being almost crushed into a fine paste by Sapp early on, Minowa swept the beast and submitted him with an Achilles lock. In the next round of the tournament, he fought 7 foot 2 Hongman Choi. While Choi had demolished the laughably crap Jose Canseco earlier in the tournament, he isn't regarded as a particularly good fighter. But the sheer size discrepancy between he and Minowa Man meant he was able to just shrug off a lot of the smaller man's attacks. But once again, Minowa Man overcame adversity and submitted Choi with a heel hook. Against all odds, the smallest man in the Super Hulk tournament had made it to the final where he would face a fighter named Remy Thierry Sokiju. 
Unlike Bob Sapp, who was only given fights because his lats could block out the sun, Sokaju was well regarded as a real fighter. He was expected to make short work of Minowa Man, so even though the two were of comparable size, yet again, Minowa Man found himself the underdog. On New Year's Eve 2009, at the Dream Super Hulk GP final, Sokaju dropped him twice and nearly submitted him. He was winning every second of the fight, right up until round three, when Minowa Man blasted him with a Hail Mary haymaker. So could you crumple to the mat, and the 5 foot 9, 185 pound Minowa Man became the Super Hulk GP champion. True to form for any freak show organization, Dream couldn't even find the Super Hulk GP belt to award it to Minowa Man. But being the superhero that he is, he wore one made by a 9 year old girl instead. Before he became Minowa Man, his nickname was The Punk. And I think that's a perfect nickname for him. The ethos of punk rock was that it didn't matter if you were unattractive or untalented. It didn't matter if you couldn't play 10 minute long solos or even play at all. As long as you had passion, attitude, and a willingness to reject the established conventions, you too could be a star. And Minowa Man, the fighter who lost more fights in a year than most people do in an entire career. The man whose biggest achievement in MMA is winning a tournament comprised of terrible fighters who just happen to be the same size as a small office block. The joke fighter who turned at first serious and then parody. The man who traded wins and losses like they were Pokemon cards yet never lost a fan. That man became a superstar in his own right. If you've ever been told you're not good enough, or told to give up on your dreams, or life has just ground you down as it generally loves to do, remember this clip of Minowa Man, seen here racing against a 747, with the full conviction that he might conceivably win this race if he just tried hard enough. And then ask yourself, what would Minowa Man do? And the answer is never fucking give up. The 2000s were the peak of the freak show fighting era. Even legit fighters got in on the action, with Fedor fighting Zulu Zinio and Hongman Choi and effortlessly demolishing both. But in much the same way as the Roaring Twenties gave way to the Great Depression, the JMMA carnival couldn't last forever. By 2007, Pride was done for, Dream followed suit in 2012, and the freak show party was over. For a few years until JMMA was resurrected like E.T. or Jon Snow with the founding of Ryzen Fighting Federation in 2015. And no discussion of freak show fighting is complete without mentioning Ryzen and the single greatest freak show fight of all time. Gabby Garcia is a jiu-jitsu black belt and MMA fighter. She's a highly decorated competitor Having taken gold multiple times in the prestigious ADCC tournament, she's fought multiple times for Ryzen and is undefeated in MMA. She's also 6 foot 2, 209 pounds, and more impressively built than a Lego Millennium Falcon. And despite being a legitimate fighter, she's not above taking spectacle fights for cash. It's December 31st, 2016. Ryzen is celebrating their one year anniversary, and as is tradition since the days of Pride, they wanted to put on a big New Year's Eve MMA spectacle. Adding Gabby Garcia to any fight is like adding mods to Skyrim. Whether you intend to or not, the end result is going to look like a spectacle. But never more so than when her opponent is a 49 year old pro wrestler who looks to have about as much real world fighting experience as Mahatma Gandhi on Valium. Garcia faced off against pro wrestling grandmother Yumiko Hata in the Ryzen New Year's Eve card of 2016. In what is both simultaneously the best and worst freak show fight of all time, Gabby was stunned into inaction as Hata ran the ropes like Hulk Hogan. 
Gabby later admitted, and I can't believe she said this with a straight face, to being in fear for her entire career, lest Hata bounce off the ropes and land a fucking rocket punch KO. Which I guess explains why Gabby proceeded to stomp the absolute dog piss out of a woman old enough to be her mother. I see some battle wounds and some bruises. That's great. And just to clarify, I don't consider this a freak show fight because I consider Garcia to be a freak. That's not the case at all. Her physique is insanely impressive. She's clearly a talented grappler. And if you think jacked women are freakish and incapable of being attractive, then we can't be friends. Garcia has openly talked about being bullied for her looks and that is awful and not something I want to be associated with. This is a freak show fight in the sense that it's a jiu-jitsu black belt, MMA fighter and person who can deadlift 410 pounds like it was nothing matched up against someone she outweighed by about 100 pounds, was 49 years old and had never fought professionally. Garcia vs Hata was more universally reviled than Velma, but given that the sanctioning body for MMA in Japan is probably the Yakuza, this won't be the last time a JMMA freak show fight makes headlines for all the wrong reasons. Like an agoraphobic golem, freak show fights exist mostly underground. They are generally just a bit too niche for the average person to enjoy. Maybe some prudes are turned off by the idea of seeing a 210 pound woman stomp a grandmother like she's a flaming bag of dog turds. Or maybe it's because they are almost without question pretty awful in terms of actual fighting or entertainment. But there are exceptions to this rule. Ali vs Anoki was a blockbuster, selling out the Budokan Hall in Japan and Shea Stadium in New York despite being worse than a Steven Seagal EDM album. And in the summer of 2017, you couldn't take a shit without seeing an advert for the biggest fight of the year, Mayweather vs McGregor. May Mac was probably the single most exhausting time to be a fight fan that I can personally think of. In the summer of 2017, the simple act of opening a web browser was something that required a half hour of mindfulness meditation beforehand in order to prepare for the unyielding trash tidal wave of opinion pieces, videos, news articles, forum posts, reddit posts, twitter posts, all discussing May Mac. In July of 2017, Connor and Floyd went on a four day, four city, trash talking world tour to promote the fight. In Toronto, they even had Drake as their fucking warm up act. In a bizarre parody of stand up comedy, Connor was the heckler on center stage that everyone came to see. Over four exhausting days, he taunted Mayweather with endless witty repartee about being a bald bitch or whatever. You stupid baldy twat! While Mayweather sat there playing Candy Crush, Dana White had to be resuscitated in an oxygen tent every time he introduced Connor. The reigning, defending, 155 pound champion of the UFC, the notorious Connor McGregor! Even the most hardcore McGregor stands seemed to agree that four days of this was overkill, as the same lines were repeated ad nauseum and each show was identical to the last. Connor would insult Floyd. Floyd would appear disinterested, and Dana's face resembled a red dwarf a little more each day. But to Connor's credit, while his trash talk never rose above the level of look at the stupid little head on you, it was still better than the descent into madness that was McGregor vs Khabib. And he did his best to sell this glitter rolled turd. As Mayweather's attempts at trash talk or selling the fight fell flatter than an ironing board with vertigo. I respect Dana White. Matter of fact, I don't just like Dana White. I love Dana White. What the hell was that? But despite the hype, the media feeding frenzy, and the sold out arenas just to hear Connor call Floyd a bald bitch for an hour, the fight itself was nothing more than an edgy reboot of Dempsey vs Wild Bull Curry. This was freak show fighting through and through. 
McGregor never stood a chance against Floyd. While he argued that a boxing match was only 50% of a fight and would be easier than getting kicked, elbowed and kneed in an MMA fight, it was the 50% of a fight that Mayweather had 21 years of experience preparing for at the highest level compared to Connor's zero years of experience as a pro boxer. Anyone who thought Connor had any kind of hope of beating Floyd would have to have been clinically brain dead, like I'm talking record breaking levels of stupidity. The kind of once in a lifetime idiocy as to be almost spectacular. Number one in the shit for wits hall of fame, a rubber head of almost classical status. You would have to have the IQ of melted cheese to think that Connor could beat Floyd. There is a way Connor can win this fight, and I. I ah, yeah, that, that checks out. While it was more entertaining than Ali vs. Anoki due to the fact that it was an actual fight, May Mac was nevertheless a farce. And that's just facts! The only aspect of the fight to be taken seriously was the financial side. Connor made 130 million for the fight, Floyd, 280 million. With paydays like that, May Mac created the template for what was to become the influencer boxing craze of the 2020s. With men wrestling bears, grannies fighting she-hulks, and literal giants fighting juiced up baseball players, you'd think it would be hard to give freak show fighting a bad name. But damn it if influencer boxing isn't doing its best. Having stared so long into the abyss of carnival ass combat, the abyss has finally stared back at us, in the form of influencer boxing. Influencer boxing is exactly as it sounds, personalities from TikTok, YouTube or whatever circle of hell is currently in vogue, battle it out to find which one of them will win clout and which one CTE. If you ever wanted to watch a bunch of Minecraft streamers with one week of boxer size training get brain damage, Creator Clash has got you covered, the brainchild of YouTuber iDubs. Creator Clash is a genuine embarrassment to combat sports and makes me wonder how in the name of Seaver Christ these people were licensed to box in the first place. But Creator Clash was so successful, part 2 is currently in the works, where you can see such pugilistic luminaries as Dad vs Ab or Froggy Fresh vs Chris Raygun all commentated upon by the dulcet tones of Jack Septic Eye. Have you ever wondered what happened to the kid from this meme? Would it shock you if I told you he took part in a backyard boxing promotion organised by some high profile YouTubers? Because that's exactly what he's up to nowadays. Keemstar and FoosieTube organised their own backyard fighting league called Happy Punch, where memes boxed memes in a depressing commentary on our society as a whole, and what could possibly go wrong with uncoordinated, untrained randos flailing wildly at each other on a concrete surface. Influencer boxing is nothing but freak show fighting repackaged for the TikTok generation. And while most of us may think this craze originated with the Paul brothers, you can blame another YouTuber entirely, KSI. KSI is a man I only know of because as a nerd, I occasionally read Eurogamer. And I remember the time he sexually harassed a whole bunch of women at one of their expos. Where have your tits gone? Where have they gone? Yeah. What do you mean? Because I can't see them. What are you doing not fingering yourself? Pardon? What? Can I moan about you? LOL women am I right? In February 2018, KSI had an amateur boxing match with another YouTuber, Joe Weller. The origin of the KSI Weller beef is less interesting than the origin of the beef found in a toilet bowl of a McDonald's restroom, but that match ultimately led to the ground zero of YouTuber boxing, KSI vs Logan Paul. Paul vs KSI was an amateur boxing match held between two men with a combined record of 1-0. Barely six months on from that time Logan had gawked and laughed at the still hanging body of a suicide victim in Japan, 800,000 of Logan's fans stayed up past their bedtime to watch the pay-per-view, earning KSI and Logan an estimated $30 million each. But while the headlines of the day were focused on Logan vs KSI, it was Logan's brother Jake who would go on to become the true poster boy for this waking nightmare from which none of us can escape. 
Jake made his amateur debut on the co-main of Logan vs KSI, where he beat KSI's brother Deji via TKO. Keeping the influencer boxing train rolling, he made his professional debut in his next fight against another YouTuber, Ann Ensign Gibb. Seen here on his way to a first round TKO loss against this man, Who's ready for camp, huh? Yet screaming with the kind of blood fervor that would make you think he was at the head of the 17th Legion on their way to the Teutoborg Forest. But go away. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Despite the TKO win over Maximus Decimus Meridiot, Paul's boxing career didn't really gain notoriety until he knocked out Nate Robinson. In the grand tradition of freak show fighting, Robinson wasn't a boxer. He was a former basketball player trying his hand at boxing. The KO went viral, and before you knew it, Jake was making headlines in the MMA world. Jake Paul is ubiquitous in combat sports in the 2020s. He's headlined some of the biggest selling pay-per-views in recent years, he's called out McGregor, and he's put the nail in the combat sports coffins of several high-profile MMA fighters. There also seems to be a softening of attitudes towards Jake from MMA fans, thanks to his stance on fighter pay, and from people in the media like Ariel Helwani, who has featured Jake on his show, conducted interviews with him for Showtime Boxing, and hosted a face-off between him and Eddie Hearn. Ariel seems to be leading the charge in the effort to sports wash Jake's image among MMA fans. And make no mistake, Jake's image is in dire need of rehabilitation. A lot of MMA fans only really know him from his fights with broken down UFC veterans, and because he's related to the guy who made big time YouTube money off a Japanese family's biggest tragedy. And because most MMA fans are old enough to ride a two-wheeler, they're not part of Jake's target demographic. As such, they don't really know a lot about him as a person, or what an exhaustively trash human being he is. And that's just facts! And we'll get to that in due time. But for now, let's look at the Paul brothers' boxing careers. While Jake is taking his boxing career seriously, for Logan, it's just another venture to add to his repertoire of things my involvement in has made objectively worse, such as YouTube, pro wrestling and acting. Don't right now? talk, officer! He only has one pro boxing match on his record, a split decision loss to everyone's favourite sex pest, KSI. But Logan does at least have one high profile fight on his stats, and that's an exhibition match against none other than our old friend Floyd Money Mayweather. You see, post May Mac, Floyd realised that all he has to do to make some easy money was use his legacy as toilet paper. In the years since May Mac, he's fought a who's who of people who aren't boxers, such as kickboxer Tenshin Nasukawa, MMA fighter Miku Asakura, and YouTuber Deji. At this point I'm pretty sure once I hit 100,000 subscribers, I'll be next in line for an exhibition against Mayweather. Floyd was in no danger against Paul, and the entire fight was nothing more than an 8 round sparring match that Floyd practically slept through. Logan has mostly left the boxing world alone in recent years, instead favouring the far more lucrative and less physically demanding world of crypto scamming. As for Jake, despite face-planting Nate Robinson with a one-punch KO, Hashtag, who's ready for camp, huh? he still wasn't taken seriously as a boxer, probably because he hadn't fought any boxers or maybe just because everyone is a hater. So the time had come for Jake to finally face some real competition, a real fighter who could push his boxing skills to breaking point. Enter former Bellator and 1FC champion, well-known knockout artist, Ben Askren. Ben Askren has worse stand-up than Brendan Schaub. Dicey, dicey! Primarily a wrestler, by the time he fought Jake he was 37 and had been retired for a year after suffering a brutal knockout at the knees of Jorge Masvidal, followed by being choked out by Damian Maya. And after a career almost entirely focused on grappling, Askren's body was so completely broken that he had all the mobility of a Resident Evil 1 character. 
Paul vs. Askren was promoted by Triller Fight Club, and if you thought Ryzen, Dream, or even Fight Circus had put on some spectacle-ass shows, Triller made them look like a convening of the United Nations. The event was four hours long, and included musical interludes from Justin Bieber, Doja Cat, Saweetie, and other names my boomer ass isn't entirely sure people aren't just making up. There was a slap fight, Snoop Dogg, and comedian Pete Davidson was on commentary. Davidson proved to be the best part of the entire show. He delivered a brutal summation of the entire event. You know, today's a really wild day for boxing because it just shows, you know, how low it's truly sunk. Before spilling the tea with Askren about what a leaking garbage bag of humanity Jake Paul really is. Why don't you like Jake? Just because he's a douche? Well, I mean, do you have an hour? I mean, like, yeah, let's go. Let's shoot, shoot. I, uh, I mean, he's not a good person. Uh, he's clearly, uh, you know, is not a good influence on any of the youth culture. That's true. Um, he kind of has this whole like following, so he thinks he can kind of do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. And like, didn't he like get busted by the feds with like AKs and like a bunch of machine guns? Like, why isn't he in jail? I think he's it's really violated the law many times. Yeah. The fight itself was another farce. Askren hobbled around the ring like a man in need of a hip replacement, which coincidentally he was. Not so much throwing punches as he was sending them in via fax machine. Paul sent him on the lightless walk in brutal fashion, and the storied career of Ben Askren, one of the most decorated wrestlers to ever compete in MMA, ended with him becoming a meme knockout on a meme fight card to a meme fighter. Hashtag, who's ready for camp, huh? This card sold 500,000 buys and reportedly made 25 million in revenue. Four months later, in August 2021, Jake faced off against former UFC welterweight champion Tyron Woodley. This time, the fight was promoted by Showtime Boxing, giving proceedings a slightly more dignified air than that of Triller Fight Club. MMA fans have been falling in and out of love with Woodley for the last few years. He is possibly the single most frustrating fighter since trying to make Zangief do a spinning pile driver with a Super Nintendo pad. Woodley was blessed with the god-given talent to put people to sleep, but in a monkey's paw style curse, it was either through his fists or his overall performance. Compared to Askren, Woodley was absolutely a step up in competition. For one, he actually has knockouts on his record, seven of them in fact. But the last time he finished anyone with strikes was 2016, when he won the welterweight title from Robbie Lawler. After that, his style changed to a much more tentative approach. There's an overused description of fighter Uriah Hall in MMA circles, in that he's like a Tekken character being played by someone who only mashes the buttons. In that sense, Woodley is like a Tekken character being played by someone who fell asleep. The end of Woodley's career was characterised by him basically having all the abilities to win a fight, yet never employing a single one of them. Jake Paul is an incredibly clever man. Don't, I'm not exactly sure like what to do today. I have a couple of ideas. We might like microwave some stuff and blow it up. Well, okay, let's not go that far. He's not exactly out here reading moral philosophy texts, though maybe he should. But let's just say he's an incredibly shrewd man. By picking Woodley, it improved his status as a fighter, as he was now fighting a legitimate former UFC champion who absolutely had knockout power. But in choosing Woodley, he made sure that yet again, he wasn't fighting a professional boxer, as Woodley had never boxed at an amateur or pro level, and he had also selected an opponent at the end of his career that he had a considerable size advantage over, that was also much older than Jake and famous for being unable to pull the trigger in a fight. The fight was an 8 round unanimous decision win for Paul. The pair would rematch several months later after Woodley made good on his promise to get an I Love Jake Paul tattoo. The rematch did not go well for Woodley. So now, Jake Paul owned brutal KO wins over UFC veterans and one basketball player. And more than ever, people were clamouring for fans to finally give him respect. And what could get Jake more respect? than taking on one of the most beloved MMA fighters of all time. Because I fucking guarantee you this, you ain't going to see Jake Paul calling Anderson Silva out. That I fucking promise you. Anderson Silva is practically deified in MMA. 
His career is too storied to even begin to go into detail with in this video, so for the sake of brevity, let's just say Silva is the greatest middleweight champion of all time, made everyone he fought look like an amateur, and seemed almost superhuman in his victories. Despite a horrific in-octagon leg break versus Chris Weidman in 2013, and the cursed run of fights that followed, which saw him only manage one win in six years, he will be enshrined forever on MMA's Mount Crushmore. Post-MMA, and already in his late 40s, he took up boxing and had two wins, a decision win over Julio Cesar Chavez and a KO win over Tito Ortiz. Impressive, but then again, beating Tito in boxing nowadays is probably about as difficult as beating him at Scrabble. Regardless, Silva was the first fighter Jake Paul faced who actually had wins in boxing. However, there were caveats. Silva was 47 years old at the time, older even than Ben Askren, and almost twice Jake's age. He had the host through others, losing the round simply from a lack of trying. And I'm not taking anything away from Jake here. Beating Silva at any age is an impressive feat. If I drop kicked an elderly Anderson Silva while he's in line at the pharmacy for heart pills, I'd consider that a real win. Jake had legitimately beaten the most legendary MMA fighter of all time. MMA fans were slowly, begrudgingly, starting to admit that maybe, just maybe, this kid is for real. In between fights, Jake engaged in one of his favourite pastimes, shitting on Dana White. Every chance he gets, Jake will dunk on Dana on social media, and Dana, being the elderly boomer he is, doesn't seem to understand that against a kid who has practically spent his entire life mastering social media and trolling people, this is a fight he can't win. Whenever Dana makes a comment about UFC fighters getting paid what they're supposed to, along comes Jake Paul to cook his ass with tweets that I'm pretty sure 100% of us would actually agree with. Fighter pay is a big issue, and in recent years it's really started to become a bad look for Dana. While he's in press conferences talking about the incredible financial state of the UFC, fighters like Aaron Blanchfield are accepting $30,000 donations from Triller Fight Club of all people, simply so she can afford to train full time. Even former featherweight king Jose Aldo said that fighters are practically paying to fight rather than getting paid. Dana's response to all of this, if you don't like it, start your own MMA promotion. So Jake coming down on the side of fighters and championing fighter pay is an easy way for him to ingratiate himself among MMA fans. So should we, as MMA fans, give Jake Paul the respect he feels he deserves? The respect that people like Ariel have tried so desperately to attach to his name. Does Jake Paul deserve our respect? Let's see. Jake is a YouTuber, but I'd be willing to bet that less than 2% of fully grown adult MMA fans, male or female, have ever sat down and watched his content. For the purposes of research, I've ruined my own YouTube algorithm by watching his videos. And I get that I'm not the target audience, but I have to question who exactly the target audience is. Jake's videos are a homunculus of weirdly sexual, deeply uncomfortable, and genuinely hateful content that should not be viewed by anyone. After watching what felt like decades of Jake Paul vlogs, with my will to live at an all-time low, I came across this excellent video by Nerd City. Their condensing of the shadier side of Jake Paul into one 40-minute video saved my sanity when it came to trawling through years of Jake's content. I'll put a link to it in the description, and suffice it to say it is well worth watching if you're still on the fence about whether or not Jake Paul deserves your respect. Jake's audience is young. Like, really young. Who is your audience? Who do you make your videos for? Yeah, my audience is definitely younger. Um, I, I'd say it's like 8 years old to like 16 years old, and so that's where I try to like cater the, the content mm -hmm. towards. When I joked about Logan's fanbase staying up past their bedtime to watch his fights, that wasn't really a joke, but Jake's content is in no way, shape, or form even remotely suitable for kids as young as his target demographic. A brief glimpse of his YouTube page reveals a lot, and I mean a lot, 
of really weirdly sexualized content. Me and my brother's best friends are both gonna end up with like the hottest, most famous porn stars in the world. What the fuck is happening? Mike compared to John. Mike and Lana, John and Riley, like, got the W there. We should go on like a triple date. You two, Mike and Lana, and me and Julia. Yeah! And then have a massive orgy after! Um, I, I would say it's like eight years old. To this bizarre kids bop version of group sex where a girl is blindfolded and has to kiss Jake and a whole bunch of his friends one after the other. To make matters even more illegal, Jake's own father, Greg Paul, joined in the fun one time, making out with a blindfolded 16 year old. Greg Paul being a creep has become so ubiquitous that even Jake's boxing opponents have used it as trash talk. You're disgusting, delusional dad. You're disgusting, man. You wouldn't mind lasting one round of all the little girls you like kissing. And then there's the one time he made the Martinez twins hump each other. He said to us, you guys should do it. And we were like, do it, do it, do yeah, it, and we were like, so why do we have to do that? How about Jake opening boxes of sex toys with adult film star Riley Reed? And with this. I wish I could do that with my girlfriend. <laughs> just the suction. Fortunately, Jake has no biological offspring of his own. Unfortunately, some parents are so money hungry, they're willing to lend their kids to Jake for cash. Jake had multiple children under the age of 10 in his crew including a kid named Titus, who was four years old when he first appeared as mini Jake Paul, and what gets clicks faster than giving toddlers PTSD. Winner. Are you gonna eat this whole thing? Most likely not. <laughs> Titus, it's Jake Paul. Yo, what did you guys do? In one video titled The Zombie Santa Took Mini Jake Paul, Jake ensures that the wages for acting in a Jake Paul vlog are a lifetime of therapy as he and Titus desperately try to avoid a murderous zombie Santa. Most four-year-olds I know can't tell the difference between TV and reality, so expecting this kid to know that the shambling horror stalking them through Jake's mansion was an actor is a big ask. But I guess traumatizing children is what gets clicks, which explains the entire series of videos where Jake, his girlfriend and their dog are threatened kidnapped and abused by home invaders dressed as creepy clowns. One of the clowns were about to kill um, uh, the blonde dog. I know they wanted to kill Thor. And they're cutting one of Jake Paul's dog's head off. Yeah, they could. They saved Jake Paul. They beat it's him with a bat to death. Again, this is all undoubtedly dreadful content. And where it aimed at adults, you wouldn't really care. But aimed at children who can't tell the difference between poorly produced YouTube trash and real life, it becomes far more problematic. But Jake isn't just an influencer, he's an edfluencer. And he's here to save you from the crushing banality of the 9 to 5 rat race. For only $7, Jake's edfluence course will teach you everything you need to know about how to be just like Jake. And the first thing you learn about Jake is that he just ripped you off, as the advertised entry fee of $7 only gets you access to one video of Jake talking about what a revolution MySpace was. For access to the rest of this virtual library of Alexandria, you have to pay $64. That's $64 to hear such pearls of wisdom as suck up to famous people online in the hopes that they notice you, follow lots of people and hope they follow you back, and if you want people to read your emails, make them interesting. The majority of the videos were two to three minutes long and had skits or gag openings that would take up a third of the overall runtime. Edfluence was nothing more than a low effort cash grab aimed at impressionable kids and shut down almost as soon as it opened. But Jake wasn't done trying to edflucate the masses. 
In 2020, he rebranded Edfluence as the Financial Freedom Movement, so called because it meant you were free to move your finances into Jake's bank account. They say we're entitled and lazy. They tell us to go to college, get a job, retire at 65. How's that working out for us? Are your parents happy? Are they living the life they wanted? There's over $1 trillion in student loan debt and people with outdated education who can't even get a job for the student loans they took out that now haunt them for life. Jake isn't entirely wrong here. Student debt is a millstone around millions of people's necks, but it's kind of a case of right message, wrong person. And he forgot one crucial fact. His core audience are still about 20 years away from giving a shit about student loan debt. For $20 per month, the financial freedom movement was essentially Edfluence 2.0, but with added Andrew Tate style, free your mind from the Matrix thinking. And the only Matrix I'm trying to free my mind from is Reloaded, Revolutions and Resurrections. This time around, instead of teaching you how to become famous on social media, Jake was trying to help you avoid the old world mindset of going to college, accruing student loan debt and working a 9 to 5. And he would achieve this by teaching you how to become famous on social media. The FFM claimed there was no magic pill to success, but apparently there is a secret formula for success. FFM was sending more mixed messages than a horny drunk on Tinder. FFM was filled with Michelin star recipes for success, such as drop out of school and start a YouTube channel, or quit your job before telling people they should take up Uber driving to make side money from the job they just quit. The reviews for FFM were ruthless, with some people calling it an outright scam. The financial freedom movement was shredded by almost every single person who used it, and the entire grift is summed up beautifully by Jake advertising that the top 10,000 movement makers would win tickets to see him on tour anywhere in 2020. Ah yes. 2020, the vintage year for live performances worldwide. Financial freedom movement collapsed faster than Edfluence. When Jake isn't trying to sell you the secrets to his success, or borderline scams disguised as societal change, he's trying to sell you his merchandise. All I want for Christmas is that Jake Paul merch! All I want for Christmas is a Jake Paul shirt! Which reminds me that there's only four days left to get the Halloween merch. Oh! Fans are not called back that Jake Paul. <laughs> Jake Paul loves merch. In pretty much every single video he's made, he spends the majority of the runtime trying to sell you his merchandise. Or should I say, trying to get the children watching his videos to harass their parents to buy his merchandise. But as exposed in the Nerd City video, Jake's merch that he's so passionate about comprises almost entirely of stolen clip art and stolen fonts. Even the font for his Rise and Be Original brand is stolen. Jake's hyper-aggressive marketing to children is something I don't even have time to talk about here as this runtime is already way too long, but suffice it to say it's entirely illegal, and if you want to get deep on it, the Nerd City video dissects it down to the bone. And then there's the crypto scams, which again I don't even have time to get into, but the YouTuber CoffeeZilla has already caught Jake promoting multiple pump and dump or rug pull crypto scams. But what I do know is that Jake Paul advertised multiple projects to fans without disclosing he was paid to promote them. His fans lost money while Jake was making somewhere in the range of two plus million dollars. And of course, his two NFT projects are both abandoned at this point. So at the end of the day, Jake Paul's fans got screwed while he got rich. But then there's the more serious stuff. Jake's first on-screen girlfriend, Alyssa Violet, claimed to have been subjected to years of mental and emotional abuse by Jake. And I want to clear the air because he's not like a um, physical abuser, like he's not an abuser, but it's mentally and emotionally 100%. Every day, 2,000 times a day, I can't even remember a conversation where it was like me walking away, like feeling good about myself. At a house party at his mansion in 2019, eight young girls were taken to hospital showing signs of being drugged. And while the LAPD said they didn't receive any reports of drugging, the girls were, quote, half naked, barely able to walk or talk, and had been forced to sign an NDA at the door. 
In 2020, allegations of sexual assault were made against Jake by a TikTok personality called Justine Paradise. Soon after, another woman, Rayleigh Lolly, also made accusations of sexual assault. Both women went on to receive harassment and death threats from committed Jake Paulers. This is the man that we, as combat sports fans, are constantly being told that it's time to give respect to. The man who spent so long boxing people who aren't boxers that his latest promotional video for his fight with Tommy Fury has to lean hard on the fact that this is the first time Jake has ever fought a boxer. He's just announced his partnership with the PFL and that he'll be having his first MMA fight soon, so for the foreseeable future, we're stuck with this guy. If there's one thing I've learned about Jake from my time writing this, it's that the only thing he respects is money. And right now, there's money in boxing for him, though arguably that well is drying up if the reports of low pay-per-view sales for the Anderson Silva fight are to be believed. Once boxing or MMA is no longer lucrative for Jake, he'll move on to his next grift, and the majority of his fans will go with him. The fans he has brought to boxing are Jake Paul fans, not boxing fans. So while some people seem to think Jake is good for boxing by bringing in new fans, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. I'd imagine the conversion rate for Jake Paul fans into Tyson Fury fans is fairly low. We've already seen him transition from YouTube to acting to rapping to edfluencing and now combat sports. And Jake is simply following the money. And sooner or later, he'll follow it somewhere other than the world of combat sports. And all the people who told you to respect Jake will be left trying to sell you their tickets for his 2020 world tour. Freak show fights have been a part of combat sports since that time when the Romans decided to find out who would win in a fight, a starving Christian or a fully grown lion. The UFC was pretty much founded on spectacle fights. In recent years, Ryzen has given us some choice cuts and people like Fight Circus made it their entire shtick. Organizations like Epic FC exist solely to put on the kind of fights that would shame Pride's ancestors. I enjoy the occasional freak show fight. I'm partial to vintages like Sap vs Noguera. Hell, I even did voiceover work for Fight Circus. But while the spectacle fights of yesteryear seem antithetical to the modern facade of MMA as a legitimate sport, the carnival barker nature of fight promotions means we're never far away from a Tony vs Couture or a Gabby vs Granny with Dana's latest passion project being the circus tent of sewage that is Power Slap, it seems like we've finally come full circle. The world's biggest MMA promoter is now hyping his pet freak show project 24-7 on the official UFC social media pages. The circus is back in town, and it is never, ever leaving. Yeah.